protest for Miriam is an award-winning activist, journalist, theologian, and speaker. A former Washington Post columnist, she is the founder of Urban Cusp, a cutting-edge online community highlighting faith, social change, culture, and global awareness. The website is urbancusp.com. You can go and visit that and see some of the work she's done over the years. Rahel is a graduate of Stanford University. Amen. Sorry, all you Cal folk in here. Praise God. And she's a graduate of Yale Divinity. She received her Master's of Divinity there. She was the inaugural William Sloan Coffin Jr. Scholar for Peace and Justice. At age 23, she served as the youngest editor-in-chief in the history of the Washington Informer newspaper. She has over two decades of organizing experience with national and international social justice organizations. Amidst the Ferguson uprising, Rahel led Not One Dime, a national economic boycott. For years, she worked in Africa, organizing with pan-African movements across the continent. Rahel has traveled the world on various delegations and humanitarian projects. She's spoken at prestigious universities and historic churches throughout the country. As a generational voice, she has been featured in the New York Times, Forbes, Ebony, Ellie, and on BET and Revolt TV. Essence Magazine named Rahel one of the nation's new civil rights leaders. And she is here uh, in a dual role. Yesterday we had a great book talk. Amen. With Reverend Rahel and her new book that has just been released in uh, the recent months called Imagine Freedom, Transforming Pain into Political and Spiritual Power, which is now available wherever books are sold. And we have a bunch of books here today. And so you'll get an opportunity to uh, purchase a book or give a donation towards a book. And we'll even set up a little table and do a little quick book signing for all you who would like to support Rahel and, and uh, uh, just ensure that uh, we keep learning and growing and being blessed by her ministry as well. And uh, I'm just grateful uh, when we were pulling together our uh, wish list for preachers to help us during this anniversary celebration season. She was at the top of our list and I'm glad that her schedule uh, allowed her to make it. She's on her way to the Essence Festival. Some of y'all familiar with the Essence, she'll be there next Sunday. So if any of y'all gonna be in Essence, uh, starting Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Y'all can look up Rahel. I think she's going to be at the new author, uh, doing a new author presentation on Sunday. So if any of y'all planning to miss church to be at Essence, amen, next Sunday. Go see Rahel, praise God. At least you get some little bit of that, that juice, amen, that Holy Ghost juice, that Essence in a powerful way. But I would love for you to stand to your feet, everyone, and please let's prepare to receive the spokeswoman for the King of Glory. She is the Reverend Rahel Tesfamerium. Let's celebrate her as she comes. This. Who wants to just thank God that we're here this morning? Who wants to thank God that you woke up in your right mind? Who doesn't take it for granted? Who wants to thank God that you have an amazing pastor who loves you? who sacrifices for you? Who wants to thank God that every trick and trap of the enemy against you did not work? That you're still here. How about that? I'm still here. It doesn't matter what condition I'm in. I might be raggedy. My mind may not be what it used to be. I don't look like what I've been through. How about that? I don't look like what I've been through, but I'm still here. I'm still here. It didn't work. You know what it was, but it didn't work. It didn't work. You're still here. Thank God. I thank God that I'm still here. I thank God. You don't know because it's not on that resume. It's not in that bio. I can't tell you what I've been through. But me and Jesus know. How about the things that only you and Jesus know? You ain't told a soul in the world. You and Jesus know. Your friends don't know. Your social media doesn't know. Your pastor doesn't know. Your husband or wife don't know, but Jesus knows. I thank you, Jesus, for the things that they don't know about me. The things they don't know about me. The things they haven't seen. There comes a time when the anointing is not glamorous. The anointing is not glamorous because
because you may not know anointing requires crushing crushing some people want the power they want the fire but they don't want the crushing the crushing so today we thank God that we survived we survived but we didn't only survive some of us are actually thriving some of us are actually thriving can you imagine can you imagine you might be that very person that used what the devil meant to destroy you and you used it for God's glory can you imagine that can you imagine that you can't take it away from me you can't take it away from me oh thank you let us go to God in prayer Oh, Jesus, I thank you. I thank you because sometimes I, I believe the lie that you're not with me. Sometimes I believe the lie that you have forsaken me. Sometimes life gets so hard that I believe the lie that you have abandoned me. But like right now, I feel you, Jesus. I feel you. If for no other moment in this moment, I feel you, Jesus. I feel your presence. I feel your power. I feel your love. And I thank you that I don't know what tomorrow will feel like. I don't even know what tonight will feel like. But in this moment, I feel your presence. I thank you. And if you could be here with me now, you could be with me tomorrow. You could be with me next week, God. I thank you for your presence, God. I thank you for your people that have come to hear a word. A word not from me, God. Not from little old me, God. Little old me but a mighty word that only the Holy Spirit can provide, God. A word full of fire, God. We, we, we know that Jesus said that he would leave the fire within us, God, to preach the gospel in an anointed way, God. So I pray, I pray for the fire, the fire that the disciples and apostles knew, God. I pray for that fire today. I feel it in my heart today, God. I pray you would just minimize me and you would magnify the Holy Spirit, God. May whoever came here from near and far get the word that they came for, God. That unique word that only the Holy Spirit can provide. That you may speak to their heart, their suffering, their pain, their agony, God. May you answer their questions and may you do it in only ways that you know how to do, God. In that sacred, secret place, may you reach them and find them, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Uh, this is actually my first time preaching in person at The Way. So this is a very, very, very special day for me because I've preached online at The Way. I've spoken at The Way. I've done a talk at The Way. I have never preached in person at The Way. And um, I, I love your pastor. He is not my friend. He is my brother. He is my comrade. I mean, we have gone to the ends of the earth together, and I love him. And I know how blessed and favored you are because you have him as your shepherd. Let's give him a round of applause for 19 years of ministry. Jesus, justice, dechurchify and belong. Yes, and that is what he embodies. I, I have learned organizing with him. I have learned how to love God's people in the messiness of life with him. And I'm just grateful that he is in my life. I thank you for your um, pastor, who I, I, I now know is not my peer, but is a little older than me, but has found the fountain of youth and won't share it with the rest of us. <laughs> has she told any of y'all where it is? I, I mean, somebody, is there one? Is there one she has told where the fountain of youth is? She's keeping that little secret to herself. She don't love us. So today, there is a word. I don't want to hold you for too long. I, I love you so much. I might try to keep you here forever. I want to go to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, <laughs> it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him a very high mountain to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. I want to preach to you today from a topic you probably are not expecting after hearing that scripture, but it goes, they are not like us. <laughs> How about all the young people that are excited to get a relevant word from God? They are not like us. They are not like us. They not like us. They are not like us. So it's been actually, I'm actually going to mention this little song a little bit and talk to you about it for a second. Some of you may not know it. I don't know where you've been if you don't know it, because it literally is everywhere. It's been nearly two months since Kendrick Lamar really, he, Kendrick Lamar comes out of caves. You know, he don't really, he just, he just goes into hiding, right? You don't know where he been. You don't know what he been doing. You don't even know if he's breathing, if he's alive, if he's somewhere with Tupac smoking something, you know, you don't know what he's doing, but he comes out of that cave and then he comes out in a way where you say where have you been my brother because we needed you right we needed you we needed this fresh anointing to fall upon us right so he comes out with this song which is actually a diss track to drake and it becomes a summer anthem so much so that you hear it remixed at church worship right I, who saw that who saw that right they remixed it into church worship. It actually became an anthem that high school students knew word for word and would dance at parties to, you know? And so it's not as legendary as the Tupac and Biggie feud. We know that. There is no such thing that is as legendary as the Tupac and Biggie feud. But there is one line in that song that really stuck with me as an organizer, as a freedom fighter. And it's probably one of the reasons that the song is taking on new meaning, right? No, you not a colleague, you a colonizer. The family matter and the truth of the matter, it was God's plan to show y'all the liar, right? In this one word, colonizer, and by bringing rival California gang members together on stage, Kendrick didn't just release a song, he created a hip hop moment in history, a hip hop moment in history, and we started to debate the nature of hip hop today. What does hip hop look and feel and taste like today? And, and what was it actually created to be? Yeah. And it created this debate that in many, in many ways is about who's on the wrong side of hip hop and also who's on the wrong side of history. Because if you're on the side of the colonizer, you're always on the wrong side of history, right? Free, free Palestine. So. The side of the colonizer. The late Nipsey Hussle, another great rapper, once argued that music executives are also using hip hop as a site of colonization. He argued that there are aspects to hip hop that are natural resources to being black. Pain, suffering, our stories, our culture, these are our natural resources, and these music executives are taking our natural resources and using them for their profits and their gain, right? And so he argued, I believe, in some ways that we need to decolonize hip-hop. Decolonize hip-hop. Now, hip-hop is not the only movement in the world in need of colonization right now, decolonization. There are a lot of things, and you know, us as believers may not want to think about the intersection of decolonization and the church, but the church needs to be decolonized as well, right? Right? What we're talking about is 
authenticity and realness. What we're talking about is what is a true reflection of the culture? Because in some ways, the church has become to, is trying to become a reflection of the culture and not a reflection of Christ, right? right? And so in this feud between Drake and Kendrick, the question is, who is doing it for the culture and who's doing it for themselves? Who's doing it for money and clout and who's doing it because they're truly, in their nature, a culture vulture? Ooh. So Kendrick has ruffled some feathers, has he not? <laughs> has he not? This is, a, this is a word that is not familiar in hip hop, colonization, but it's a word that's really very, very relevant to everything that's happening right now, right? Everything that's happening right now. And so hip hop is not the only movement in need of decolonization right now. As Christians, we too wanna believe that they are not like us, right? They are not like us. We too claim that we are set apart from non-believers. Our brand of Christianity is the idea that we're not like them. And we take great tremendous pride in this idea that we're not like them. That we are the authentic image of our savior. See, now you're starting to get quiet. <laughs> Don't think I didn't notice. <laughs> I noticed all of a sudden it hit a little too close to home, right? But we have our own turf wars. We have our own turf wars. They're along denominational lines. They're along theological lines. And we are always battling who is the true Christian. You know, is it Baptist? Is it Pentecost? Matter of fact, we had that same uh, argument yesterday at lunch. <laughs> Apostolic. <laughs> Baptist. Y'all should have heard Reverend Jackie and uh, Pastor Mike about who was going to have to wait in line at the gates of the Because <laughs> the Baptists were going to be busy drinking and dancing, but the holy folks were going to get that straight path to heaven. They didn't even know I was preaching about this today, but they gave me some fuel for the fire. But that's what we do. We have these turf wars, right? We have these turf wars fighting over who has the organic brand of Christianity? And can you even imagine that we think of the word brand in relation to Christ, a capitalistic word, a word that comes out of empire, a word that is individualistic, a word that is about promotion and self-promotion, that we use that to talk about the sacrificial lamb? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. This is all complicated by bad theology and bad pastors. I said it, you don't often hear it, but there are bad pastors. There are. And there are pastors who look more like capitalism than they do Christ, right? And so as we say they're not like us, we forget that sometimes we're a lot like them. We're a lot like them. We're a lot like them. Many of us would never admit it, but we want the glorious ministry of Jesus without the gruesome sacrifices he had to make. We want the popularity without the persecution. We want the heaven of being worshipped. We, we don't want the hell of what he endured. We don't want the blood. We want the glamour. There are all these ways in which we want the mountaintop of followers and disciples, but we don't want the valley of the shadow of death. We only want one side of Jesus' story. We want the resurrection without the crucifixion, right? But you can't rush to the resurrection. You got to sit in the messiness and the ugliness and the horror of the crucifixion. And we have an entire Christianity that rushes to the resurrection. And so people are not ready for healing because you're rushing them to a place that they're not prepared to receive. So we want greatness without grief. We want greatness without grief. And how, how can you know what it's like to truly value something if you've never lost anything, right? How do you value something if you've never lost anything? It's too many of us, honestly, we don't want Christ. We want Christ's fame. We want his fame. We want his popularity, the most well-known name in the world. The most worshipped man, the man that everybody bows down to, that's what we really want. 
We pretend like we want the cross. We don't want the cross. We don't want nothing to do with the cross. And if you truly admit it, if you put yourself on a pedestal, then you're asking God to step down. And a lot of us have asked God to get out the way so that we can be on top. And in a world like that, no wonder people go around saying they're not like us. They're not like us. They're not like us. As if you've made it to a side where you're not supposed to bring other people along with you. You cross the Jordan and don't want to bring anybody over the river. You cross the Red Sea, but we still want to leave them in Egypt. So I thank God that we don't have to question the nature of Christ. We don't have to question who Christ was because the blueprint is already there. I thank Christ that we follow a Savior who did not want to keep the secrets to himself. Who made it crystal clear, who made it very evident. My question to you is, what does it matter if they not like us, if we're not like him? Huh? Huh? What does it matter if they not like us, if we're not like him? And so this passage in Matthew 4 gives us a great glimpse into understanding who Christ was. His very nature, because I don't know about you, but that's what I'm yearning to see. In a world where leaders are counterfeit, where leaders are silicone and not organic, where leaders, anybody could be a thought leader right now. If you have access to the internet, you can be a thought leader right now. We live in dangerous times where everybody is a self-appointed leader, a self-made leader. And so I want to go to the original blueprint of what it means to be a leader, of what it means to follow him. Because like I said, what does it matter if they not like us, if we're not like him? So. It's important to remember that these temptations and tests that Jesus faced was right before he was on the verge of ministry. Imagine, right when you're about to do what God has called you to do, you can't move to the next step until you've first been tested. Some of you are wondering, why is it that every time you're on the brink of the promised land, you're in your wilderness moment, you're facing those tests? You're facing those temptations because you can't make it to the other side until you have proven you are worthy to cross over. It's worthy to cross over. And if you don't believe me, just think about the children of Israel in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness longing for Egypt. So imagine God loves you enough to bring you to the other side and you're still romanticizing Pharaoh. It's just like being in a relationship with a good man, but you're missing the one that used to abuse you. You finally got the brother that loves you, prays for you, treats you right, but you're thinking about the one that used to have you going crazy, right? And that's really what it was. Here was Christ in this, pre in the, here was God loving on these people, feeding them, giving them manna, taking care of them, nurturing them. And they're thinking about the way that they used to eat in captivity. How they ate in captivity because they gotten so close to Pharaoh that they wanted to be Pharaoh. They wanted to be Pharaoh's children and not God's children. And so this is why the wilderness is important because God doesn't rush everybody to the promised land. God, God says some people will die in the wilderness. And we don't want to accept that truth, but some of us are not fit for the promised land. Not fit for the promised land. Some of us will die in the wilderness because an entire generation was declared unfit for the promised land and had to die so that a new generation who had an appetite for freedom. That's what we're talking about. What do you have an appetite for? What do you hunger for? What is your palate yearning for? Is it liberation or is it luxury? What is it that you hunger for? Because that thing that you hunger for is what God will give you for eternity. 
That thing that you hunger for is what you will have for eternity. You will feed off of it forever. So God, let them stay in the wilderness. You want the wilderness? Stay in the wilderness. You want Pharaoh? Stay with Pharaoh. You won't make it to the promised land until you begin to desire the promised land. Until you hunger the promised land. Until there's nothing that you want but the promised land. So change your appetite. You hungering for the wrong things. And so in Matthew 4, we get a glimpse of what Jesus hungered for. What was it that his appetite had fed off of to prepare him for this moment? Because when it comes time for the promised land, and there's many promised lands. There's an earthly promised land, and there's an eternal promised land. And there are some people who will experience the promised land on earth but never have it in heaven. See? So don't get it twisted. Don't think that just because you got the good life here, you're going to have the good eternal life. There's some people living real nice right now. But I don't want to go where they're going. I don't want the promised land that they're promised to in eternity, right? So don't cover what your neighbor has. You take a look at your own plate. Take a look at your own plate. Today. <laughs> in Matthew 4, the first test is one of humility. The, one, the, the first test. And so I had to sit with this question of why was humility the first test? Why? Why? See, the ego must be put in check. The ego must be put in check, and if the ego is not put in check, nothing else will be put in check. So although Jesus is the word, he couldn't use his own words to feed himself. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Could you imagine being the word and not being able to use the word to free yourself? He had to suppress his power. He had to suppress his capacity. And that takes humility. In one moment, he had to set aside all his needs, all his desires. For who but you? Don't get it twisted. He did it for you. Because he could have ate, but you wouldn't have salvation right now. He could have fed off the bread, but you wouldn't be liberated from that addiction you have right now. He could have had that bread, but you wouldn't have found that lover that took you out of captivity from that abuse of domestic violence that you were enduring before. He could have had that bread, but you could have been in prison for the rest of your life instead of just five years, right? There are all these ways in which that bread was a question of life and death, and he chose life, your life. He thank, thank you, Jesus. How about that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you chose the bread of life. The bread of life and not just bread for that day, right? And some of us need to make decisions with an eternal mindset and not just what it feels good in a day, right? Everything that you put in your body, put that thing in your body with a question of what does this mean for eternity? Am I going to be living on earth for my children and my grandchildren? What are the multi-generational implications of every decision I make every single day of my life? multi-generational implications because that's what Jesus did Jesus made a multi-generational decision instead of doing what felt good to him in that moment and some of us need to start thinking and deciding based on that how are future generations going to be affected by what I put in my body affected by my desires and my lust and my and my selfishness and my ego how are future generations going to die from the life I choose today? Now, see, Jesus was prepared. And you won't expect this, but it was his vulnerability that prepared him. When I looked at Matthew, that chapter begins with him being tested over and over again, even as a baby. And what I mean by that is the kings knew who he was. And in that point, he still had to maintain vulnerability and trust his parents to protect him. Wow. Right? His parents. That he came into this world as God, 
but had to lean on Mary and Joseph to protect him from the ones who were coming after him to kill him. And he took on the vulnerability. And so he humbled himself. Can you imagine kings wanting to kill a baby because they see a threat in that baby? You, you know why you can't be who God has called you to be, some of you? Because you don't see how you're a threat to the enemy. You don't see, you haven't put the pieces of the puzzle together. You haven't put the pieces of the puzzle together. You haven't figured out that if I went through all this in my life, all this in my life, if I went through all this in my life, somebody somewhere sees me as a threat, right? It's not by accident that I went through all of this and you haven't put the pieces of the puzzle together. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. So the question becomes, why was the first test one of humility? The Latin word connects humility to the word humus, which means humble, but not only humble, peep this, it also means from the earth. It means grounded. It means grounded. And see, the ego is very important because the ego is fertile ground for the enemy to get the victory. If you are moved by ego, you've given the enemy fertile ground to do whatever he wants to do in your life. Because ego puts itself before God. I want to thank Pastor Mike. And I want to thank him for his humility. I want to thank him for his self-sacrifice. I want to thank him for what he's done in California, but what also he's done in the United States and what he's done all over the world. I want to thank him for modeling humility because I don't want to just deconstruct. I want to lift up. I want to lift up the people who are not following culture, but following Christ, right? And this is a man who can go from Ferguson to the White House. And not too many people can do that. Not too many people can go from Ferguson to the White House and sit at the table of organizers in Ferguson and then sit at the table of, of the VP and the President of the United States, right? So I just, I wanna uplift who he is as a man, as a man of God. And I wanna, in contrast, point to the Christians and the pastors who forget that we are not called to be the Messiah. I say it again, we are not called to be the Messiah. And see, there's a difference between thinking you're called to be the Messiah and realizing you're called to worship the Messiah, yeah. right? And we got a lot of people out here who want to be the Messiah, the anointed one, the anointed one. That's what it means, the anointed one, the anointed one. We're called to worship the anointed one. And we're also not called to be the sacrificial lamb. See, there's another form of, of, of thinking you're the Messiah. It's called having a Messiah complex. A Messiah complex. You think that things cannot happen unless you're in the room. Meetings can't take place unless you attend. Phone calls can't take place unless you're on the line because you have a Messiah complex. And it plays out in relationships, it plays out in ministry, where you think that you are the answer to everybody's question. Sometimes the most powerful thing you can do is be quiet. The most powerful thing you could do is be quiet. Learn to listen. I need to learn to listen, okay? Because the bad thing about being a speaker and an organizer and an activist is that you're so used to opening your mouth. And I am working very hard to learn to shut up and listen. And I have a child that is teaching me how to do that every day of my life, right? Because she runs that house. I do not. So I learn how to listen to her because if she doesn't get what she wants, I don't have peace, right? So there's a way in which some of the most powerful ways we can move in the world is from a place of, of humility and being quiet, right? And so... We are called to stand firm in our belief that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, not us. Jesus is the Genesis and the Revelation, not us. And so, secondly, there's a test of mental health. There's a test of mental health. The devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. I didn't anticipate saying this, but 
do you realize that we have a mental health crisis in this country, not amongst just only the general population, but also amongst our youth? amongst our youth, that our young people are committing suicide, our young people are suffering from anxiety, our young people are suffering from depression, contemplating whether or not they should be on this earth. And why do you think that is? If Jesus could be tempted in his mental health, don't you think that that's the attack that the enemy would have on an entire generation? Because if he could take your mind, he has everything else, right? And the Republicans are coming after our minds. You think that's an example of, of, of strategy? No, that's spiritual warfare. It's spiritual warfare. They understand. If they can get our minds, they have everything else. And you think they want our votes? No. It's not just our votes. They want our despair. They want us to feel like we have no hope. They want us to be suicidal. They don't want to do the work. They want us to do it ourselves. And there's a way in which we're handing this generation over to the enemy every single day. We're doing it through social media. Literally, their minds are being controlled every single day. And so I encourage you, you know, you often think that in your low moments of life is when your mental health is going to be challenged, right? But here, Jesus is challenged at the highest point over and over again, at the high altitude, at the highest point, right before he reaches the Sermon on the Mount, right before he starts his public ministry. Basically, when he's on the verge of greatness is when the test comes, right when he's looking out to the promised land, right when they were going into Canaan, right? It happens before the promised land. And you know what it is? Some of you don't realize that you're literally on the cusp of greatness. You're literally on the edge. All you got to do is get through this one little test and you have lost hope. When God is saying to you, baby, just make it to the other side. I believe you can do it. I believe you can. Standing on the verge of greatness, Jesus' mental health was tested. He wasn't the only one. The prophet Elijah in 1 Kings. Prophet Elijah had done many, many amazing things in the spiritual realm, had defeated Jezebel, had defeated the gods of the pagan gods. And you know what he did immediately after that? He suffered from depression. Immediately after that, he went into hiding. He went into isolation. He didn't celebrate. He didn't count God's victory. He went into hiding and isolation. And you know what? There's a way in which we now have a president whose cognitive abilities are being questioned, right? And there's a way in which defeat almost becomes inevitable that when you can prove someone doesn't have the psychological capacity to lead, it's over for them, right? And so now you got people questioning, are there second options for presidency? Does it have to be Biden? Because now their question, is he fit psychologically to lead? And so if you could take away someone's mental capacity, you take away their leadership capacity. You take away everything from them. And so we live in a world that is coming for our mental health. And you may not believe me, but if you think about the looping of images we've seen out of Palestine, we have seen decapitated babies on a, on a, on a regular basis. We've seen babies burned and scorched. They're showing us things to just in many ways push us to the edge of insanity, right? And we are normalizing this where we can look at this for months and months and months like this is normal. It is not normal to witness a genocide. It is not normal to witness a decapitated baby. It is not normal to see bodies scorched and people starving. And how has the empire gotten so comfortable that it can normalize a genocide on our phones? How did we let the empire get that comfortable? We're living in a moment in which we are being gaslit. We are collectively, it's, be, it's one thing to be gaslit by a partner. It's another thing to be gaslit by your president. And we are being gaslit by our commander in chief. I know how you all feel about Trump. I feel the same way. 
But what there is power in recognizing is when a Democrat can fund and condone genocide and tell you you don't see what you know you see. You're being gaslit. And there's this abusive relationship we have with the United States where we are being psychologically abused by the United States right now. We are being emotionally abused because they're telling us, I'm going to keep abusing you and you're not going to do nothing about it. You're going to vote for me. The black vote is a democratic vote. And I don't say this so that you would question who to vote for. I say this so that you would question what they're trying to do to your mental capacity. They literally are gaslighting us from the White House. But it's not nothing new. They've always done this. They just haven't necessarily been so obvious and overt with it. My God, can you be a little apologetic? Just a, just a tad bit apologetic? I mean, come on. So lastly, lastly, there's a test of idolatry. Verse 8 says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms in the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. First, it's important again to notice that the test keeps happening at the mountaintop moments. And you know why this is so important? When you're in the valley, you know you're vulnerable. When you're in your mountaintop moments, you are not thinking that you are weak. Right? But the mountaintop was where the test took place. And that's why you often fail the test because you don't realize how vulnerable you are at the mountaintop moment. You're vulnerable at the top. And we see it. We saw it on that debate between Trump and Biden, the vulnerability of those at the top, right? and the vulnerability of us waiting for them to do what they do and have our lives in their hands and control us. We are vulnerable and, and they are vulnerable because you know what? They've already succumbed to ego. They've already succumbed to ego. And so the question becomes, who are you bowing down to? What are you bowing down to? What have you made your God? And Jesus' refusal to bow down to, you have to know this, Jesus' refusal to bow down to Satan was not just a personal test. It was a statement of victory. It was a statement of victory. This was a moment of spiritual warfare that represented the fact that the ultimate defeat over Satan was established and Christ had won. The victory belongs to Jesus. The victory belongs to Jesus. No wonder from that point on, the angels ministered to him because the God Almighty had been declared. The test had already been won. And it was very clear that there was only one God, one God worthy of bowing down and worshiping, and the angels ministered to that God. So that's when Jesus begins his public ministry. It's when he begins preaching. It's when he begins, because now he had made it clear, I am the anointed one. I am the deliverer. I am the savior. I am the Messiah. I am the Lord Almighty, right? It had been declared. He was humble enough to know that in order to have his name worshipped for all generations, he would have to establish himself as the one and only true God. You know, I have to say this. I, I, I want to shout out Odette and Naomi, who drove all the way from Sacramento. Can y'all show them some love? And they were here um, with Brother Raymond, a former Black Panther, yesterday. And um, that is Naomi's father. And that has really, 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 really honored me, um, been an honor to me to know that they made that sacrifice of driving all the way from Sacramento to be here. And what I want to say to them is that they keep me going. They keep me going because they are showing that this generation will not bow down to empire. This generation will not bow down to capitalism. This generation will not bow down to the American dream and the falsehood of the American dream. This generation will not bow down to celebrity worship. This generation will not bow down to culture. This generation will not bow down to depression and suicide. 
that this generation is going to rise up. Yeah. This generation is going to rise up. What we saw happen on those campuses, never forget what we saw happen on those campuses. Those kids did not, you said, they said, we, we want to graduate, but we don't want to put our graduations over our values and our commitments. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to hold our own graduation, right? And to see them at Columbia of all places, right? To see them at the pinnacle of success where they are supposed to go and be created to be followers. They go to places like Stanford where I went. They go to places like Yale to learn how to conform, to learn how to fit in, to learn how to be a part of the status quo. But they said, I don't want what you have to offer. Because if I got to bow down to genocide to do this, I'm not doing it, right? So I thank God for this generation. I thank God for them. I thank God for them. And so in conclusion, I, I, I want to celebrate the fact that Kendrick Lamar reminded us that, you know, with the billboards, the Rolling Stones of the world, the New York Times, the Washington Post, we're at, we're at a point now where even our, our media is questioned. Yeah. We're questioning the news outlets that we thought were neutral and realizing they're not neutral at all, right? And so there's this way in which Kendrick does this beautiful thing where he says that, you know, I don't care who wins the awards. I don't care who makes the list because I'm moved and motivated by a different standard a standard, and his standard looks very different than the status quo. The fact that he had those, those gang members, Bloods and Crips on stage dancing together, the standard was realness. The standard was authenticity. The, the standard was, what is your proximity to the hood? That was the standard, right? What was your proximity to suffering? You, one of your boys ever been killed? You know what it's like to bury somebody that you went to school with? Drake, you don't know that life. You don't know that life. So Kendrick was coming from a different standard. And so when we talk about they not like us, we have to ask ourselves, what is the standard that we're bowing down to? What is the standard? I thank God that I have learned over my life that the standards of this world will never fill me up. I have the degrees. I have them from prestigious institutions, and they never made me feel like enough. How about people here who can testify to the fact that you had it all and still didn't feel like enough? That you had the very thing that you prayed for five years ago, 10 years ago, one year ago. You got everything that you prayed for, and it still wasn't enough. We need to get to a point where the standard changes so that we can begin to feel like enough. The standard can't be Kim Kardashian. The standard can't be Jay-Z. The standard can't be Beyonce. The standard cannot be Beyonce. The standard cannot be Beyonce. <laughs> because you will never feel like enough if that's the standard. The standard has to always be Jesus. And so, you know, this church has set a standard that I thank God for, a standard of inclusivity, a standard of belonging, a standard of worshiping and bowing down only to Jesus, right? Not to capitalism, not to funding, not, not to funding and fundraisers. Thank you for the standard that this church follows. So in conclusion, I want to say to you, How did Jesus become that man? Because before he was the Messiah, he was a man. How did he become that man? In many ways, his life was regular. His life was normal. He, he was a baby protected by his parents. We don't even know what his teenage years were like. We don't know what he was like as a kid. We just assume he led a normal life. The one thing, the one moment that was very important prior to this wilderness moment was the baptism. He was baptized by John the Baptist. First of all, let's acknowledge that he was baptized by a thug because John the Baptist was a thug, right? So, 
I mean, you can't get more hood than John the Baptist. I mean, I, I, I love it. I love it. It's like he went to the hood to get baptized, right? So anyway, the, the significance of this baptism taking place before the wilderness moment is that when Jesus came up out of the water, Matthew 3, 17, you hear a voice from the heaven, and it says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine that before the test, before the temptation, before the public ministry, before the Sermon on the Mount, before the crucifixion, before the resurrection, before the miracles, before the resurrection of, of the dead, before the healing, before the deliverance of the demon-possessed people, God said, I am well pleased. I am well pleased. Baby, you ain't got to do nothing. You ain't got to do nothing. Baby, you ain't got to do nothing. I know I'm saying that to somebody, and you don't have to do anything. I am well pleased. I am well pleased with you because I made you. I know you. I love you. You are made in my image, not their image. I am the standard. They're not the standard. I am am well pleased if you don't remember anything else you remember that god says to you i am well pleased i am well pleased i am well pleased thank you <laughs>